It's time for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope. Larry Lasseur from the CBS television news staff and August Heckscher, chief editorial writer for the New York Herald Tribune. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Norman Thomas. Well, our guest tonight may not have been the most successful man that ever ran for president of the United States, but surely he was one of the most persistent. He was a presidential candidate six time on the Socialist Party ticket, but now Mr. Thomas devotes his time to writing and talking and thinking about the problems of the post-war world. And Mr. Thomas, the world recently witnessed a, the victory of a Socialist Party in power in England uh, directly after the war, but the Bevan government wasn't much of a success. Now, do you still feel that the uh, socialization of big industries is the uh, solution to social problems? Well, first, I'm going to uh, remind you that it was the Attlee and not the Bevan government, and that it was a very considerable success, that England and Europe are very much better off uh, you have no idea how many troubles would have happened if they hadn't. And if you'd had Churchill, I doubt if you'd had the settlement in Burma and India, and you might have had Indochina scattered all over the world. Do you attribute that to the fact that it was a socialist government? Yes, I do, because socialism, uh, not perfectly, but socialism was more definitely in favor of independence than the conservatives were. I do not think and never did that the final uh, road to heaven is uh, state ownership. But I do think there are certain things that should be publicly owned, things like the natural resources and certain monopolies and oligopolies, but they should also be democratically managed. The British Labour government played out its score, and it was a good score, but uh, there remain things to be done. What you, will, what you will remember, of course, that they got a bigger popular vote in the general election than the Conservatives, who won more seats in Parliament. True, but uh, what about world socialism, Mr. Thomas? Do you think that... Uh, if democratic socialism were adopted the world over, that would be a, an answer to uh, permanent peace? Yes, in the same sense that I believe that if real Christianity were adopted, it would be an answer to permanent peace. Norman, do you think that... Hardly any other sense. Well, do you think that the socialists in Europe might together form some kind of a, of a third force? They ought to, they might, especially if you could get any kind of, a kind of integration in Western Europe. Uh, you've got to remember that democratic socialists, partly because they are democratic, have to win by programs of immediate appeal to the voters in the country. And nationalism cuts across, of necessity. And uh, it isn't, it isn't uh, uh, disloyalty to socialist ideals, but uh, practical politics that uh, brings it about that Paul Henri Spock, a good socialist, could declare rather pessimistically that the thing that... Uh, Socialists had learned best to nationalize was socialism. <laughs> well, how about the Marxian theory of the uh, ever-increasing conflict between the classes? Do you uh -huh. American socialists hold with that? No, and most socialists have uh, really uh, abandoned that, at least in its extreme and most rigid sense. Most uh, democratic socialists would now tell you that they advance socialism as the necessary fulfillment of democracy, the application of democracy in the field of economics. Norman, you said earlier that uh, British Toryism had failed in the colonial problem in Asia. Do you think that the uh, American democracy has succeeded or is succeeding any better? No, chiefly by a kind of a combination of uh, modesty and arrogance. Uh, every now and then we're so modest that we won't speak up to the French on the subject of what should be done. And every now and then, it, perhaps unconsciously, we're so arrogant that we introduce, or seem to our friends, to introduce a new ki kind of isolationism, a sort of Uncle Sam knows best isolationism, which doesn't persuade them to go along. Uh, I think the substance of our intentions is pretty good. Our manners need to be improved. Well, Norman, you were a, uh, an articulate pacifist uh, in World War I at least. Now, how do you, would you feel about sending of troops to Indochina now uh, to uh, wage war or to stem uh, communist aggression as a part of American uh, democracy? Uh, terribly. Not because I am longer a, a, a religious pacifist in the sense that I once was. In some ways, I wish I were. Uh, I have, uh, for a good long while, accepted the principle of collective security as a, a necessity in our modern wa world. I supported to Truman's policy in Korea, as you probably know. 
I think that it would be the worst of all things, and many things are bad, were America to go it alone in, into China, or to intervene alone, or without support of Asian opinion, or without a far better uh, base native support than is now evident. I, I was horrified by the trial balloon Nixon uh, flu. I thought that was dangerous. One of the most likely ways, I think, to get into World War III, and one of the worst, would have been that. And I am convinced that if we had gone it alone, such is Asian feeling, that the communists could uh, have exploited even in our hour of victory after a cruel and nasty war, hate and fear of suspicion of us and the rest of Asia so that we would have been incredibly hurt. How do you it, think we could win Asian support uh, then? No? Only by a far yeah. better practice of persuasion than we have followed. Only by a, a degree of patience. Only by lifting up their hearts with hope. I have been twice, two successive years in Asia, and one of the things that worries me is the, our failure t to make the average Asian believe that it is really we who care for peace. If only it's things that Truman and Eisenhower had said, for instance, have said about universal disarmament under proper controls could have been lifted to the level of a kind of an ideological crusade, always keeping up our strength, we would have been better off. We would have been better off if we'd used the United Nations a little more patiently in the matter of Indochina. We'd have been infinitely better off if we'd been clear-cut in opposition to colonialism and didn't seem to inherit the colonialism of the French and because so on. Because we couldn't, but, yes. Oh, well, I'm sorry, but Norman, you then could um, see conditions under which you would uh, be willing to support American participation in united action in Asia. It isn't the idea of ground troops there that horrifies you, it's the idea of ground troops in conditions that now exist. Uh, well, it horrifies me to think of the, uh, the agony of it, but some things that horrify me may have to be accepted. Yeah. And I think it's quite uh, dangerous nonsense to talk about war without thinking of ground troops. That is the notion that you can win by a couple of injudiciously uh, distributed bombs is dangerous well, how do you nonsense. feel about uh, massive retaliation, uh, Norman? Do you feel it's practical as a threat or practical as a military operation? Or uh, I suspect that if we come to the horror of Third World War, there'll be plenty of re retaliation and massive retaliation. But I think the way that Mr. Dulles, whose good intentions also I admit, the way he used the phrase, his instant and massive retaliation, and I could bring mountains of evidence of this, had the effect of scaring uh, lots of the American people and practically all our friends, and not much effect in scaring Cho and Lai or Molotov or Malenkov. It was, in other words, a, 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 a neither practicable nor wise to speak as he spoke. He's been explaining it ever since. I wonder whether, uh, Larry, we could change the subject a little bit. Norman, you have... Uh, been around and seen a great deal in the field of civil liberties over a long period of time. I just wonder how you do feel about uh, the atmosphere that exists in this country today compared, let's say, let's say, to the atmosphere that existed after the First World War. In some ways, the atmosphere immediately after the First World War, not only the atmosphere, but the actual things done were worse. Uh, after all, civil liberties reached their lowest ebb under that extraordinarily illiberal liberal Woodrow Wilson with the... Uh, the Ark, the Beaufort, you remember, and the deportations, and the thousands of people arrested in what a historian has called Mitchell Palmer's obscene anti-red uh, raids, and the Lusk laws. Uh, the campuses, college campuses, were far more closed and intolerant than they are today. The situation today is, heaven knows, very bad, uh, and a comparison, especially in a couple of minutes, or uh, you don't even allow that, I know, uh, is, uh, cannot be scientifically pressed. Well, Norman, you got about a million votes in 1932. I think that was the largest number you ever amassed. Now, do you know anything that's what's happened to those people who did vote for you, who registered socialists, well, when I they try to get jobs in I civil suppose, service? Uh, I government? suppose that even in this country of happiness, where we all are living longer and longer and longer, a lot of them are dead. But of the <laughs> living and, and a good many before they were dead, they turned Democrat, at least for the nonce. Was that uh, passed then held against them? Uh, uh, the they, uh, a lot of them got jobs under Roosevelt. Uh, and some of them have still got jobs, but they aren't socialists uh, uh, by acknowledgement anymore. I do not look at the past with unmixed satisfaction, but I do find myself slightly amused when the Republican president, so ably supported by the uh, editorial writer of the Herald Tribune, uh, really got around to sending messages. He sent a complete and comprehensive survey for a welfare state. Now, I don't quite like his version of the welfare state for reasons we won't go into. But there wasn't any basis for it in 32 in anybody's platform or anybody's speeches but mine. 
Uh, I accept the bows of the audience. <laughs> uh, Norm, I ask you this as a last question, since you just have about a minute. Uh, what do you think of the future of the Socialist Party here in America? Well, I have said publicly and in the party that, uh, that uh, the present party hasn't much of a future. Uh, I still hope that it can be a, an educational agency, and I still hope that in some measure it can serve as a catalytic force to do what we need. That is to help to cure our instrumental poverty. Our democracy is very weak in its instruments when we have two parties, two major parties, and that's what the situation requires constitutionally, in which both of which the differences are so much greater than they are in the average between them. That means irresponsible parties. And it's very hard to govern in democracy with irresponsible parties. And the great ambition of my life, the reason I ran so often, was not because I thought I'd be elected or the Socialist Party as such would win. Uh, I thought the Socialist ideal uh, uh, should win, and I wanted to be a, it to be a catalytic as well as an educational agency in bringing about a new political alignment, a realignment. In other words, we think we're going away from socialistism as you thought of it even in those days of 1932. Well, thank God not being a Republican, I can admit that I can change my mind. I don't have to talk the language of 1920 and do the things in 1954. That's the difference between me and, a Repu and some Republicans. Uh, and I, therefore, will gladly admit that I have t uh, learned enough to change my mind. But my fundamental convictions have not changed, as I could prove by citing quotations. Well, thank you Even to much. Senator McCarthy, I can prove oh. it. <laughs> thank you very much, Norman Thank Thomas. God I don't have to. Great privilege to have you here. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lesseur and August Texture. Our distinguished guest was Norman Thomas, veteran socialist leader and chairman of the post-war World Council. When next you buy a watch, either for yourself or as an important gift, in all probability, your jeweler will show you models of almost every make of watch that you can name at Longines prices and even higher. Now, what's your best buy in this situation? Let's look at the record together. It is very significant that of all the watchmakers of the world, only Longines has won 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals. In a word, the highest honors for superiority of manufacture. Now, what about accuracy? In the Grand Championship Contest for Watchmakers, the accuracy trials at the National Observatories, Longines watches have established many records, won countless prizes and honors for exceptional accuracy. And what is the opinion of the scientists? In all fields of precise timing, in sports, aviation, and science, Longines is everywhere the watch of first choice. Now, these facts point to an inescapable conclusion. When next you buy a watch, either for yourself or as an important gift, if you pay $71.50 or more, you're paying the price of a Longines, and you should insist on getting a Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches.